Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Josh, alcoholic. Josh. Hey, guys. So... Just before I came over here, I was sort of frantically cinching down my canoe, and uh, I had to I had to tie a bowline. And my dad taught me how to tie a bowline when I was really young. He was a sailor, and so I was really glad that I knew how to tie a bowline because I know that that knot will last and work. I I don't have to question it. I just blind faith sort of thing. And I was like, wow, that's kind of a good metaphor for AA. You know, it's like, this is a tested knot, <laughs> in, a, in a sense. It's like, uh, and, you know, prior, I, okay, so let me back up. Um, I got sober on June 18th, 2009 uh, in Annapolis, Maryland. I was sort of shuffled from psych ward to treatment center to halfway house down in Florida, uh, Delray Beach, which is the sober capital. And it was, um, man, it was, it was, it was rough. I, you know, I, I was just looking and noticing that you have only seven days and you're smiling. I was like, Shh, I don't think I smiled for like three months, man. I was just confused. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, it was, it was a rebirth, an unplanned sort of rebirth that, in an existential rebirth, I was like, whoa, now, now what, what do I do? Uh, show me, you know, so, and then this, and then so they, they sort of brought me into the rooms, and I started, you know, through these intangible uh, elements, I'm like, oh my God, I'm starting to regain that zest for life, you know, I'm like smiling, laughing and I'm listening to these people and I'm like and I'm like oh my god you know you know it all started for me like when I was in high school uh I would I would look around and I'd see people and I'd be like oh I kind of want to be like that person and then I would go and drink and I would and then the social awkwardness would go away the anxieties would go away and I was like oh this is great and then so I quickly, you know, scouted out more for people with a sort of pension for destruction that I had. And then, okay, so then it escalated quickly into this really bad addiction for me. And I remember uh, at one point I was, in, I guess, my early 30s, and I, and I I was just sitting at home alone, you know, sort of floundering on the couch and my all my drugs that I was taking. And I just quietly resigned to myself like this is who I am uh I'm gonna die a drug addict alcoholic and and I I just I didn't I had it was just this weird myopic shroud I couldn't really see beyond that I didn't I didn't know about life beyond that I didn't know about uh a spiritual experience or anything like that every you know I was just I was measuring success on material objects, man. It was like, check out my Rolex. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> and seeking these status symbols, you know. And then uh, through some nasty twists and turns, uh, you know, it was it was really a, a awakening moment to me to be like, oh wow, I, I can. There's a spiritual world out there. And I, I grew up atheist. My father and my and my mom were both, they didn't really practice anything. And so I didn't, I didn't have that knowledge or I didn't even know those doors existed uh, until I came to AA. And uh, what a treat it is to know that these places exist. Uh, and, and, 
I think that the paramount element for me is that this is like my coping skill, my coping mechanism now where when I'm stressed out and like, and, and I, I'm anxious and I don't know really what to do, I can call a sponsor. I can sort of uh, reflect on the book. I can call other people in sobriety and I can be like, oh, shit, I, okay. Um, it's not the end of the world. Like these are these, not having that coping skill before. I really felt like I don't know. I just felt precarious in life. It was um, it was like trying to tie my canoe down without a bowline. It's like, is it going to stay? Is, it, is this going to fly off and kill somebody? I mean, that's I, it's like, how did I not kill somebody? I mean, I was just like driving around drunk, nodding off at red lights. God, it was like, I don't know. I, I disguised it really well, too, for 14 years. It was, um, I had a shirt in college that said, cleverly disguised as a responsible adult. And, uh, man, that fit me to a T, part of the cliche. Uh, but, and so it wasn't until I was having these drug tests, I was working in Boston, on some really big construction jobs. And the guy, I failed a drug test for a Harvard University job. And, and, and like a week later, my boss pulled me aside and was like, uh, so we found morphine, crack cocaine, uh, alcohol. And, uh, and I was like, fuck. It caught up to me. It really did. And I was just like, I just remember that feeling of going like, holy shit, now what? Like, what do I do? How, how do I, how do I go from, like, and, and so it was like, I remember I, I, I had, you know, okay, so I hit some hard times after that. I lost my job and I was defaulting on my mortgage and I finally called my mom and said, I need help. And then, uh, that's what led me into this sort of psychotic breakdown in Maryland and then through the uh, psych ward system, which was pretty bizarre. Uh, so back to AA, um, man, what a, like I said before, like this, this is such a good place to get this sort of tangible uh, recharging, this sort of, you know, I can, I can come in here and I, I usually sit in the back and I can just sort of, I, I just listen and I pay attention to whatever the people are saying. Because, you know, for me, I have to I have to hear this stuff over and over again. You know, I can't just read it once and then think myself into that solution. I, I have to be repeatedly sort of punched by this community. Like, hey, what do you, no, bad idea. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really a wonderful place. I just moved here to Oakland. I'm still pretty green and I, I don't have a sponsor yet. I'm still looking, but, um, I'm excited to be here and sharing with you guys and hopefully you got something. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to turn the meeting over to our main speaker, Janice. This is me. Okay. What time do I speak until? Um, until eight. What was it? I'll give you a ten minute and then a five minute. Okay. It basically goes. Where is it? Until eight fifty-five. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Um, is this working? Yes. Okay. Hi. I'm Janice. I'm an alcoholic. Janice. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's funny because I've been in my room all day long, like staring at a computer working, and this is just really refreshing for me. And as I was leaving, um, you know, about resentments, it's funny because you'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be totally fine. And then somebody will just say something, and then I see red. And um, and then I'm playing it over in my head. Maybe you can relate. Um, so that happened. Um, and 
I thought, well, I guess I'm going to go to a meeting and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Um, so I also, this, I never do this, but I wrote some notes down just so I could stay on point because it's, I don't think I've ever spoken this long before in a meeting. Um, and, um, my sobriety date is March 4th, 2007, and I'm 36 years old. And those are the two statistics I'll tell you because I think it's really important to hear, like for me, when I was first getting sober and somebody would share that they had 30 days or five years or whatever, first, the first that I thought was, you're lying. And, <laughs> um, but later it turned to like, wow, that's so cool. Maybe, maybe I can have that too sometime, you know? Um, and why I share how old I am is because it's humbling because I think I'm getting old. Like, I plug white hairs out of my head every day. Um, and, um, you know, over the summer, I spent, like, $200 to get my hair colored to try and hide my white hairs. So it's just like, you know, I'm just trying to practice a little bit of humility. What I used to do um, for most of my sobriety, up until maybe about a year or two ago, I used to tell you, like, I have... 10,000 commitments in AA. I have 5 million sponsees. I have, uh, you know, I do this and this and this and this, and I would just have like, this like, checklist. And I did it <clears throat> because I was afraid of being wrong, and I was afraid of being looked at, and, um, and I wanted an A and AA. And the short version of the story of why that's changed for me, why I only tell you the two, those two things as far as my statistics go, is because, um, is because, uh, what, what did I just say? Well, why, why I used to say that was so that you'd never look at me and that I could, you know, I could just put my, put, I put myself on a pedestal. And, um, and I've been humbled over the years, um, with just like life in general. And, um, and I don't want to be on a pedestal. I want to be on the ground level with my people. And I feel that when I am real about what's really going on, I'm more relatable. And if I'm more relatable, then maybe I could be more helpful. And as being a sober woman in AA, that's my main purpose now. Um, so <clears throat> let's see, I've been uncomfortable for as long as I can remember, it's sprinkled with moments of relief and like throughout my whole childhood, I just felt uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, when I found out, and I don't think that that's an alcoholic condition. I think that's a human condition to be uncomfortable and, um, to feel sensitive about things. Um, the difference is, is that when I found alcohol, <clears throat> that became my solution to my discomfort. And it was everything that I wanted to help me with, with, you know, like the world was too big and heavy for my like little brain to like wrap its head around, you know? And, um, and, uh, I don't think that my childhood necessarily contributed to my alcoholism. I just think this is like, you know, I've, I've heard people over the years have the childhood that I think that I, I thought that I wanted and they still ended up in AA, you know? Um, so I stopped like looking to blame my parents and like blaming my upbringing. Um, and it was painful at times and lonely, but, um, <clears throat> I don't think that's why I drank. Um, I also didn't drink because I liked the taste of alcohol. In fact, I think it's fucking disgusting. Um, and that's why I always, you know, paired it with, I don't know, something that would help dilute the flavor because I wanted the effect. If I could just, like, crack open my chest and pour, like, bottles of alcohol onto it, that's what I would have done, you know? I just didn't want to feel anything in here. And um, and so, and that's why I also I've had a love affair with every kind of alcohol possible, Um Oh, it's not, you know what? It's not tequila anymore. It's like tequila's, I need to do whiskey. Um, I need to do gin. I need to start pairing it with drugs. I need, you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to do wine because I'm classy. And I really want to like smell the earth in the freaking glass. No, I don't. 
I want to drink. And I want to get hung. I want to, like, be wasted. So, like, I don't know. I don't know how to drink one. And why, why, even now thinking, like, trying to drink one, why would I do that? That sounds so stupid to me. Like, if, like, I, I want everything, all of it. And, and, um, <clears throat> so I have a friend who, we went out to dinner a little while ago and, um, he was like looking at the beer on the menu and he ordered a beer and, um, and he had like half of the beer and, I just kept think, like waiting for him to like change, you know, because like when I, as soon as like alcohol touched my lips, I changed. Like I just morphed into somebody else. Like it gave me balls basically because like, you know, if, if I had thoughts about you, you were going to hear them. Once I got alcohol in my system, and if I liked you, I was going to hit on you really desperately, you know, and like just things like that. Like I just like it, it helped, um, it just helped me. And, but he, he stayed the same. And when we left the restaurant, he was the same person we know with half a beer in his belly. He was the same person he was when we walked in and he had no alcohol in his system. So like, it's that fascinates me because I, I just don't understand that, you know? Um, so my drinking's really boring now. Um, I, I worked in the uh, service industry for a very long time and, um, thought I was like, you know, the shit. Because I would make money and have drink with my friends and had access to all this alcohol and drugs. And um, I know we're in Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's kind of funny that, like, I would have rings of cocaine around my nose. And then somebody would be like, do you have any blow? And I'm like, no, I don't have any. <laughs> um, and, like, and so my world revolved around how can I drink? How can I do drugs? How can I stay fucked up. I told my sons I wasn't going to curse today. Um, and how could I then like, you know, uh, not be hungover. Um, so it was just like, that's all I was doing. That's all my world revolved around that. I've had people in my life who I thought had really bad drinking problems come to me and try and tell me that they were worried about me, you know? And I'm like, really? <laughs> and, uh, cause, and then I, and then I've also had you know, relationships, romantic relationships and just friendships and co like, like relationships with my employers and whatnot, <clears throat> where, um, they would also at one point or another tell me that they, they were concerned and I would play the role of like, yeah, you know, you're so right. I'm so sorry. Like I'm going to straighten up and get it together. And then I would find a convenient way to get them out of my life because when it when it's between them and alcohol, they were always going to lose. Um, and then I'll just tell you one little short story about, because there's so many, like I could just do a whole meeting on like the ridiculous things I did, but I like to just share like one, not one in particular all the time, but I just like to share one when I share so that, <clears throat> um, to just kind of like, it, it just explains my drinking in general. <clears throat> I, I stopped bartending and I got an office job because I thought an office is going to like straighten me out. And I like worked downtown like nine to five, you know, put on the office clothes and like thought I was good. Um, I of course found the one person in there who had the Adderall and I also discovered happy hour. Um, like, and I also discovered that you can drink on your lunch break. And, um, and so <clears throat> I, I had run out of excuses. I had started to like drink on, you know, not just the weekend, but like during the week and showing up, not showing up to work and everybody died and my family and friends. And like I had run out of all, like I, all the excuses. I even one time said I had hemorrhoids and I couldn't sit down in my office chair, like, you know, like getting really creative about it. And, um, and, um, <laughs> One then one, I was like, you know, on a Sunday and I needed to go to work on Monday and my friends were like, tell them you have pink eye. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, I have pink eye. And pink eye, you know, is contagious and it lasts for a few days. And that's what I told my bosses. I was like, it's contagious and it lasts for a few days and I can't come in. So not only did I buy myself Monday, I bought myself like all the way to Thursday. I thought it was genius. So I get to work and, um... I'm paranoid. I'm paranoid that they know I'm lying. 
so I thought I'll just spray my eyeball with perfume every 20 minutes in the bathroom and I'll be like you know what it's I'm not contagious but clearly I had it pink eye (laughs) but I'm good now don't worry and um so that's so funny right like now it's funny but if you think about like what the hell like normal people don't do that and like what was going on with me that I thought that that was okay like what you know like how much was I suffering that I would go to like that those lengths to like just to buy myself some more time drinking so that's what I was like um then I told you that I like you know look uh, removed out anybody who had a problem with my drinking but then I met this one person who was like my match like he could keep up with my drinking we, we got you know we started living together in a relationship he was a bartender <clears throat> and uh, one weekend he um, it was a very tumultuous relationship very abusive and emotionally and physically and um, uh, he like, decided that he was going to do all these drugs and drinking for the whole weekend. And it was around the time when online banking started to become a thing. And um, you could watch, like, your activity live on the computer. And um, we had a shared bank account. And um, he was missing, not picking up his phone all weekend. And I'm at home drinking wine, smoking cigarettes watching all of our money just like dwindle and he's like oh he's in north beach oh he's at the strip club oh he's at this liquor store seven thousand dollars and so um when he came home i said if you want to stay together you have to go get help and so we went to a meeting and i didn't even know that that was what was going to happen he had been in AA previously and was like well there's a say blah 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 and i was like okay whatever we go to the meeting and i'm sitting there with my arms crossed, like, are you listening? <laughs> and, um, and this woman is speaking, and um, <clears throat> she looks nothing like me. Um, she She's happy. She's, like, happy and clean. And, um, and I don't even remember what she was saying, but I knew that I hated her. And because... I just thought, like, who the hell does she think she is coming up here being all happy and shit and, like, you know, talking like, a, she's like, whatever, like, you know? And um, and so after that meeting ended, I, I basically told my ex-boyfriend, I said, you don't have to go to AA. Like, whatever, we'll figure this out. We eventually broke up. I did what I always do. I went out with my girlfriends and I was drinking. And I was, my body was drunk, but my mind was on fire. Like it wouldn't, it wasn't drunk. My mind was not drunk. The thoughts were racing, everything. Um, I'd be like dancing one moment and then I'd be like, you know, crying in the next moment. And, uh, and it was just like that. And so <clears throat> I was scared because what I had known to work all my life was not working anymore. When we, uh, and I ended up going back to that room that he had took me to for the meeting. And I sat in the back with my sweats and my baseball cap and my sunglasses, and I cried. And I cried and I cried and I cried. And I stayed there all day long, every day. And people would come up to me and say things, and I didn't know what they were saying. I was like, it was so blurry. It's so foggy. But um, I just knew I was safe there. And I knew that um, they were they were, like, vibrating, like, something they were vibrating love I suppose and um eventually I stopped crying I started like inching my way from the back like the baseball cap came off like the you know and it just started to like kind of wake up little by little it took me six months to get 30 days like, I would go back out and I would drink and I would put together three days, two weeks, one week, whatever. But I kept coming back to the rooms, drunk, hungover. Like, and um, <clears throat> I, uh, I remember it was um, St. Patty's Day. And um, so my sobriety dates March 4th. 
and said March 17th, I think is St. Patty's Day. I really should know this because I'm like super Irish, but um, I um, am not. Um, and so um, my friends were all drinking, like my, that I had, and they were, and I went with them. And in the beginning of the day, it was like, Janice, it's so awesome. You're, you're like getting sober. And, um, and then at uh, one point, um, my best friend, who is actually in rooms now, um, was like, I fucking hate you not drinking. And I was like, and I fell under pressure, and I was like, I'll just have a drink, you know? And I ordered a glass of white wine. And my friend and I are sitting there, and we're staring at each other, death stare, smoking cigarettes, just like, you know, so many thoughts, like, running through our heads. Mm-hmm. And But the thought that was running through my head is, I really don't want that drink. I really don't. But I just, like, I really want to, like, get 30 days sober. <laughs> and, um, and then my friend comes, another friend comes back empty-handed with no white wine and says, the bartender has white wine, but she didn't pour it because it's warm. She put it on ice. Do you want something else to drink? I said, no. And I went home. And I stayed sober. And it was this moment where I was like, oh, my God. There was, like, this window, you know, and, like, and something helped me. And that was all I needed was a glimpse. And then I believed. And then I kept believing. And then I kept seeing. And it's just, like, and I have to say, even after, you know, nine-plus years, those moments continue to happen. I'm awake to them and I see them and I, I like, I like being for them, you know, like doing fat lines of God every day. And so, <laughs> I, um, so, <laughs> um, okay. So then I did the steps and I'm cured. Blah, yay, we are done. Okay, no. Um, <laughs> getting sober is weird. Right? It's so weird. I was so worried about not having fun. I was like, like I was having any fun anyway. I mean, who am I kidding? Like I was always end up alone in my apartment listening to Fiona Apple and like smoking cigarettes, right? <laughs> Writing really bad poetry, <laughs> which I still have. And um, actually, it's funny. There's this line where it's like you could tell I was like drunk and like. <laughs> and then I do like a bump and it'd be like all straight and like very emotional. Um I think those are good to remember. To um so I was determined to be able to to find out if I could have fun being sober. And so like I did all the stuff. I like had awkward coffee dates and went to <laughs> high school feeling dances and um you know, and just, like, went on the camping trips and the ski trips and, like, went to meetings and did fellowship and all that stuff. And then eventually this community built was starting to build around me. And <clears throat> I started to, like, I started to get well, you know. And part of it was because the thing I was telling you about earlier where I wanted to get an A and AA, that's a defect of mine, like, people-pleasing. But God used it to, like, help me. Because I wanted to do so well, I did everything my sponsor said because I wanted to be her best sponsee ever in her life ever, you know? And so because I was doing that, I was actually, like, reaping the benefits of being in AA because she had me do a lot of shit, a lot of shit. And I would bitch about, oh, I'm so losing on the cursing thing. Okay, so... um, to thy own self be true, whatever. And so, um, <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah. So I would bitch to all my friends about, can you believe she's having me, like, sit up front and go to a meeting every day? Like, rude, you know? And, like, she's having me, like, get commitments or have to, like, say hi to people. And they're like, you know, whatever. Um, but I was doing it and it was working. And she also lived, um, at like the steepest hill in San Francisco, I, I decided. And, um, <laughs> and I didn't have a car at the time and walking up there was hard. I didn't have money to take a cab. So walking up there was hard. Then I got a bike. Pushing my bike up there was hard. Um, but I was just like, whatever, any links. But it was also kind of symbolic because I'd go up there and I'd be like, tell her all my stuff when we do the step work. And then I'd just like ride my bike like we down the hill. Um, do you feel me? Okay. So. 
I, anyways, I had her for the majority of my sobriety. I love that woman. She is nothing like me. And, like, you know, she's, like, this, like, surfer, dog walker, weirdo, tattooed, like, hell of whatever. And, like, you know, but she got me. And she was honest with me. And she was, like, she called me out on my shit. And when we were together, we were working. You know, I had girlfriends who I could co- have co sign my stuff or whatever, but we were like doing work, you know? And, um, and I, I love her to death and she saved my life. And I remember I thought, um, I thought, I'm gonna get her a card, <laughs> like her present or something, you know, when we were done with the steps, which by the way, you're never really done, whoever's new. Um, and so, <laughs> um, and so, um, I remember I like, I, I, I was telling her, I was telling her I was going to get her a card or some present. And she said, I just want you to keep giving what I gave you. Like, give, keep giving it away. You know what I mean? And like, she's like, that's the best thing you can do. And like, that is so true. You know, like, sometimes I don't want to show up. Sometimes I don't want to meet my sponsors. Sometimes I don't want to do my commit. And I don't always. And, but like, then I, I feel so indebted to her and to AA that it's just like, I can, just, I can do this, you know, um, I'm skipping. So I did the steps and, you know, the steps are like, um, so I won't talk about all of them cause I'm just not that cool to be like step one, blah, 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 PowerPoint. But, um, I, um, <laughs> I definitely know I'm powerless over alcohol. I can't have one. I can't drink like normal people. And when I do shit goes down right? I lose people. I lose self-respect. I hurt people. I hurt myself. Um, I'm, I'm sick, you know, uh, the insanity that we talk about here is not like, look at me, I'm crazy. You know, it's not like that. It's like, it's crazy for me to think that this time when I do this, it's going to be different if I keep doing the same stuff, you know? Um, and then, God, I think one of the most genius things about AA is God is we understand him. So, like, it could be whatever. I'll just tell you right now. My God is RuPaul, okay? Like, I just, like, <laughs> really feel her. Like, I just, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's RuPaul. Sometimes it's, like, a gangster dude, like, riding around in a Cadillac. Sometimes it's the wind, you know? Because it's, like, you can't see it. You can't measure it. You can't, like bottle it up but you know you, you it's moving stuff you feel it you know that's a power greater than myself um sometimes when it's really windy I pretend God's like hugging me or playing with my hair um and like I can say all this and you, you usually be like that's weird but you can't tell me I can't do that you know and um and so I think that's just such a genius thing especially because I also grew up in a Filipino Catholic voodoo home okay so like God and Jesus and all that was really like I had a it I wasn't feeling it and um and my mom used to send she still does <laughs> send me cards of like prayer cards and stuff in the mail <laughs> and like text about like you know um how God's like here and loves me and all this stuff I used to hate it I hated her for doing that I love it. I love it now. She just did it yesterday, and I was like, "You're the sweetest ever," you know. And it's like because her God and my God are so different, but it's not really. We're just like we're both. We're both it's it's really the same, you know. And so it's like this way we're bonding now. Inventory. I need to do one on that resentment I just told you about when I first came in here. But also, um, I thought that I'd like show with my to my sponsors. Has to be like, this is my inventory. Let's go kill everybody on this bus. And, um, <laughs> that didn't happen. And um, so it's like a house cleaning. I, I, I really love visuals. And so, like, when I was drinking, my house was, you know, a mess. Like, it wasn't welcoming. <clears throat> There's, like, the refrigerators, like, you know, has moldy stuff and those sofas and the stairway and like everything's blocking whatever it's like bad feng shui and um 
And what happened is, is my sponsor comes in there and it's like, do you need this bag of shit? And I'm like, yes, I love that bag of shit. Like, <laughs> and I was like, do you want to look at it? Do you want to smell it? Like, let's, let's play with it. She's like, no, you don't need this. And so we would just like go through and just clean out all my bags of shit. <laughs> and then they'd be like, oh, but we forgot the attic. Like, it just never stops. It's like the house cleaning never stops. But it gets to a good place, right, where it's like, the sunlight of the spirit starts to come in and I can invite people into my home and my, like the emotional rearrangement that we talked about in the book. That's, that's what happened. And also I need to be able to tell another human being because just like one-on-one conversation, like it gets twisted. Like I can't see myself clearly all the time. So it's always nice to have a sponsor to check me. Um, <clears throat> and then it's so like the six and seven like defect stuff (laughs) it's not like what's wrong with me and how I'm so messed up it's like it's old behaviors that I use tools that I've had that have served me for so long like I've had you know I've been on my own since I was 16 years old like I've had to hustle and work and like whatever and I picked up a lot of really funky ass tools along the way but they really helped me survive you know I don't need them anymore. I forget that, but I keep getting reminded. So I try something new, you know, and sometimes those defects, like I see, I just, my sponsor had this joke of like, I'd be like, I'd come in her house and like, and another thing. And then she said, blah, blah, blah. And her code, we've developed this thing where it was like, oh, better take your hoops off, Janice, because it's like, (laughs) you know, I was just like, so right. And, um, so sometimes I see other people like with my defects and I'm like, Ooh, that doesn't look cute. Is that what I look like when I'm doing that? And, you know, so sometimes I'm sure, I'm sure God uses me to show you how cute, not cute your defects are. And, um, so that is like a continual thing too. And I really feel it just so happens around year six and seven that I started to become really familiar with what those defects are. I never hope to be rendered white as snow, ever. That's boring. Boring. And so I just, like, would rather, (laughs) like, um, then I would also have nothing else to work on. I'd be hollow perfect, and I wouldn't even have to come to AA anymore, right? And, like, also I wouldn't be able to relate to my sponsees, or if somebody else calls me and they're, like, sharing their stuff, I would be like, oh, no, girl, I've done with that, lost that defect years ago, like, I'm cool, don't worry, blog, you hang up, like, you know, like, no, so they keep me humble and useful, so I'm happy to have them, sometimes, so, um, sometimes I've worked on things, like, for so long, it feels like, and then it's, like, right there again, I'm like, what are you doing here, I've worked on, I've worked, I've written about you forever, I have a cool sign, okay, so, um, I've also made a lot of amends, financial amends. <clears throat> I just pretended I would like write fifty dollars a check every month to like certain people, and I would just pretend it was like I'm paying fifty dollars to stay sober today, you know. And um, and I imagined this like little AA like thing they were like adding up, and like Janice gets to stay sober today because she paid her amends, you know, whatever. I needed that because I didn't want to pay that money back. I felt entitled, and um. Just also, like, living amends, like, when I go to my mom's house, I don't take her cool mom stuff. Like, you know, when I go there, I'd be like, oh, you, I would just, like, help myself to her makeup and her clothes and her stuff because I felt entitled. And then she'd be like, did you take? I'm like, no. And now when I go there, I don't take any of her stuff, you know, without asking. <laughs> um, and I'll, <clears throat> so it's just, like, because also I feel like, being sober and really believing that there's a higher power, there's enough to go around. When I was drinking and using, like, the thing when I told you I would lie when there was coke in my nose, I don't feel like I need to hoard everything all the time. You know, like, I'm like, there's, it's a part in the book where it's like, <clears throat> God is all-inclusive, expansive, like, big. There's enough. We can all have eight balls. God. And so, um, so, and then I just live in 10, 11, 12, you know, I check myself, um, every day, not successfully all the time. Um, I pray all the time. I've been doing it this whole time I've been up here speaking. Um, 
I close my eyes and I meditate. I also do open eye meditation. I'm just like, you know, I'm just like awake. I'm plugged in. Not And <clears throat> and then sponsees, I also thought that that like the step 12, somehow I misinterpreted it and I was like, have sponsees, lots of them. That's what I read for step 12, right? Um, that's not what it says. Um, having had a spiritual awakening, you know, and like practicing these principles and all our affairs, carrying the message so that I can do that not only in AA, like I, you know, I tried it like the, now my world has opened up. It's pretty big and I just try to be useful. Like I'm, I try <clears throat> to be of service at school. I try to be of service at work. I like whatever. It's just, it's not, I learn it here, but I, I can use it here and out there. And it can seem like a normal functioning member of society who's contributing something good to the world, which is really helpful right now because I have a lot of feelings about what's been happening here in the States. And, um, and I feel like as a sober woman in AA, I could just do my part here. I have a special gift. So do all of you, where we can just like be of service and like start where we are and hope that that expands out. Um, <clears throat> so what it's like today, um, let's see, when I first got sober I, and I started to realize that I can do things, I started to write this list of all the stuff I wanted. I wanted to learn how to play the piano. I wanted to go to school. I wanted to travel. I wanted whatever. And you know what? I got all that stuff and more. I'm not saying this is about the cash and prizes because also all that stuff comes and goes, right? But there's like this <clears throat> inside okayness that I get out of being in AA and being a member here. Um, I also, so I like I woke up this morning and I didn't want to die. I woke up this morning and I wasn't hungover. I woke up this morning and I knew <laughs> who the person was who was laying next to me. I know what happened the night before. You know what I mean? Like, I, 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 tonight I'm going to, like, take my contacts out. I'm going to, like, wash my face. I'm going to be nice to myself. I'm going to know what happened today. I mean, I used to fall asleep with, like, a half whopper in my hand and, like, with, like all my clothes on and, like, you know, like, didn't brush my teeth, like, that's not cute. And so like, you know, and so there's like drunk girl things like marks in my, for me, for my, like that I know, like I'm kind of slipping where it's like, I'm not taking care of myself. Um, when did you tell 55? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> I haven't done AA perfectly. And I'm really glad about that. I haven't done life perfectly. Um, there has been, I'm really trying to give you a positive message with also saying the truth is, is like there have been some really hard and dark times in sobriety. Um, I've gone, like, just this last year, this fucking year sucked so bad for me. Does that for you? So I, um, let's see. My, uh, my, I broke up with somebody who I loved a lot, um, and that was really hard, um, but it was amicable and it was like sweet and everything, and that's me, because how breakups normally happen for me was like me cheating, them cheating, like stuff flying in the air, like really hurtful things being said that you can't really take back, um, so that was like a grown up break up. Um, my dad, who has been really, who was really sick <clears throat> for a very long time and who I had a very a strange relationship with and uh, passed away over the summer. And um, let's see what else. I had to move out of a home that I had like known, like where I lived with all these uh, other sober women who I really love and um, our place got sold. Um, and so those are like three kind of major things that might have happened like in a short span of time. But I got to say, <clears throat> I was surrounded by people 
who know me and love me. I went to meetings. I did. I just, I just like AA held me the same way that it held me when I first went into the rooms and actually throughout all over the years. Um, and you know what I really, <clears throat> it's, there's a part in the book that I was, re- I didn't even look at my notes. <laughs> um, I was just at a meeting, uh, last week and the part in the fellowship it was read, I read it about, um, the best years of your existence lie ahead of you. And it's true. While these, some, some, there have been some dark and hard times, this has actually have, has also been the best years of my life that I've, since I've been sober. Um, it's just like, it, it's, if I stay here and I say, you know, uh, active, and I'm not always, but like it's just I have a chance of like growing. I'm not sitting on a bar still talking to some studio talking about all the things that I'm gonna do someday. Like I'm doing some of those things, or I'm, I, and I know who I'm talking to, you know. And I'm not, and then the alcohol like put a wall a, between me and everybody and the world, and I couldn't like feel it or see it clearly. And now it's like I it gave me the lie that I was connecting, but I wasn't. And now that I'm in AA, I feel like. I'm able to connect now with people on a much deeper level. And more importantly, um, I also just am so tired, like, in the sense of, like, I don't want to pretend to be anybody else than who I am. Like, I don't have the energy to do it. I play it out, like, you know how I, like, play out that drink and see how that goes. I now play out me not being authentic, and I'm like, well, oh, that fucking no way, you know? <laughs> You're going to find out who I am anyway. So it's like... You know, I just, I want to be my authentic self. My my teacher, (laughs) my sponsor, who is my teacher, um, she, uh, she told me one time, um, just because everybody likes you doesn't mean that you're lovable. It just means that you're like pissing a lot of ass and you're not telling the truth. And so, um, (laughs) um, and let's see what else. So, yeah, I... I hope you got something out of what I said because uh, being here and being of service makes it all worth it. I wanted to die before I came into AA and I did a lot of things that I wasn't proud of. And, um, now it's not a waste, like it's useful, you know, um, I was in a motor, even, even the things that happened in sobriety, I was in a motor, I'll end with this. I was in a motorcycle accident a few summers ago and, um, they gave me Dilaudid, which is synthesized heroin. I don't know if you guys ever did it, but it was pretty cool, but, um, then it wasn't because I was feeling really hungover and foggy and I didn't like it. And, um, and I don't wish anybody to be in an accident of any kind, but like three months later, my sponsor got in a motorcycle accident and I was like, you know what I mean? That was a really hard time for me. And I was able to immediately like use it, you know, my experience for service and, um, and share that and help her as much as I could. So, um, Anyways, I am really glad to be here, and um, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.